It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 332 of Science on Top. We are back for another season. Today is Sunday the 19th of May 2019. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hey. And clinical research nurse who's just completed a master's in bioethics, Joe Benamou. Hi everyone. Hi Ed. And before we start, a quick reminder to everyone to go to scienceontop.com slash donate If you want to help us make the show, just a few dollars each episode is a big help in keeping us going. So, Penny, do you want to start by telling the class what you did over the break? (laughs) Yeah, well, I think I'm one of the reasons that we've started back a little bit later. I was away on a school camp, which usually is not very momentous, but I actually was lucky enough to go to the Mungo Youth Project. And it's a 10-week program. It starts with... um, you know, research back at the school and it culminates in almost this conference at Lake Mungo where students teach each other, but we also, you know, learn from archaeologists and Aboriginal elders and so on. So Lake Mungo is really special. It's one of the few areas that's um, a world heritage area for both its wilderness and cultural values. So it's got some really um, important quaternary sediments there, but it's also got some really important human remains. Um, A lot of our listeners might have heard of Mungo Man and Mungo Lady, at least maybe the Australian listeners, who were found um, by a geomorphologist called Jim Bowler, who I met there. And they're the specimen or the the human remains that are dated to around 50,000 years, which really pushed back at the time our understanding of how long Aboriginal people had been living in Australia. Mm. So the the environment in the national park there is, um, even though it's called a lake, it hasn't been a lake, I think, for 10,000 years. But in the past, people would come there and live seasonally. And so there's some fascinating archaeology there. The way that archaeology is done there is different to what you think. Essentially, you just go every so often, the wind whips off layers of sand and do a surface survey of what's found there's not really much excavation. Something that's there one day might not be there the next day. So it's, it's a really interesting environment and I felt really lucky to be there. But one of the things that I was really interested in is um, Jim Bowler, who I mentioned, was talking. Do you remember we talked about that, um, the research done near Warrnambool mm-hmm. on term, in evidence of human occupation yep, yep. Um, from about 100,000 years ago? And he was saying, yeah, like, we found all this stuff. We didn't want to put it out saying, yes, it's people, even though everyone who worked on it was convinced that mm. it was evidence of human occupation. But, you know, just publishing it, this is what it is, and leaving people to make their own decisions. But I just get the feeling that there's just so much more coming out, perhaps even new finds at Mungo, which are just really exciting. And it was just really different for me because I, I did archaeology at uni and it's something I always loved and I loved the science of it and the way that it brought together science and humanity. And um, I eventually went into teaching because I think I realised that my passion wasn't really doing science but more science communication and for me teaching was the most direct way to be a science communicator. I'm not much of an author or anything like that. Um, And I just found it really, really exciting to just re-engage with what's really happening at the moment in Australian archaeology and the way that so many different stakeholders, so there's the the elders, the pastoralists, the archaeologists, the World Heritage, all have to work together to kind of preserve and study this environment. It was really exciting. Um, And, yeah, it's given me just, I think, It's one thing to read about digs, but to actually be in the site, Mm. talk to the people who are working there, you know, talk to the people whose culture is represented, you know, 
by the findings and say, oh, yeah, you know. And one of, even one of the things that is there is you can see, you can't see the real ones, but you can see a plaster cast of footprints and you can tell um, what's been happening with these footprints. A group of people were walking along. There was a woman. One hip was, or one foot was heavier than the other. Then it shifted. So she's moved her baby from one hip to the other one. A little kid runs up. She moves the baby. The kid runs away and then follows behind a couple of metres. Oh. So she's probably come up, been annoying, had a bit of a whack or told to break <laughs> off, sucked off and come. And I thought, well, that's just, you know, it, it, it really helped me. It adds an actual human element to human it and identify To connect with these people, not just, not even a stone tool, but, you know, the remains of what was left over from making a stone tool. Mm. Like, you know, as they say, everything that's left in archaeological sites is often rubbish, like yeah. people's trash. So anyway, I don't want to go on too long, but it was really exciting and it was interesting because for me, I thought that Lake Mungo was this, you know, World Heritage Site that everyone had heard of, but I was surprised how many people hadn't heard of it and how many Australians, you know, didn't really know about it. Um, I do have to say, like, we camped there. I'm not ultra into outdoor air. Like, I found it cold <laughs> and a bit miserable and there was a dust storm and it rained and the roads closed. And there was a moment where I thought, oh, my goodness, we're not going to be able to leave. Wow. I'm going to have to stay in this tent for another night. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> you being as <laughs> dramatic as I the stayed. students. <laughs> yeah, being, oh, can I say, students were fantastic. I was the one with the issues. <laughs> but, um, no, it was really great. And if anyone who's listening does get a chance to travel to Lake Mungo, um, it's a couple of hours north of Mildura you know, in central Australia, it, it was worth it. And it, yeah, I found it fascinating, is fascinating there, place. Is there a lot to see and do? Like, are there exhibits and displays and things or? There is, I'd say it would be like a day trip for Mildura really, unless there's, there's a, a mountain bike or walking mm -hmm. trail that you can do like a two day kind of thing where you can camp. But if you just want to do it as a day trip, um, there's a visitor's center and you can go to the visitor centre. There's a lot of displays there. I think you can then go either on a self-guided boardwalk tour or if with a guide, you can actually go up to what's called the Walls of China, which is the, the old sand dune that, would have, that was at the edge of the lake. So the landscape itself, in some ways, it's a bit blah and flat until you realise what you're looking at, which is, you know, it was an ancient lake bed. And then you can look way out into the distance and see the other edge of where the lake would have been. And up on the walls of China is where you can see artefacts. Like we saw, you know, a 9,000 year old fireplace that was just there and some bits of ochre that had been left. And, you know, the bones of a wombat that had died in its hole. And, you know, they were probably like 15,000 years old. So you can sort of tell how old things are just by where they're positioned in the dune. Okay. So... It's, um, yeah, it's a really, really different kind of scenery, different to what, um, you know, in Victoria you mostly see in our national parks. This podcast has received no funding from the Mildura Tourist Board or... No, Lake no, Mungo. not at all, I have to say. This is just, purely just me. Um, just. I think there's a website, like I should just say, visit mungo.com.au, I think, or something. I should check that. I'm sure if you Google visit Mungo you'll find something but but also look at look up the um mungo man and mungo lady because they were mm. the, the important um cultural as well as uh, yeah archaeological discoveries that uh, really worth looking into and there, i know there was a lot of um uh, d d debate and contention about what happened with the remains um they were mm. taken they were studied off-site for a long time and it was i think 2003 or 2001 maybe they were returned no. no oh like three years ago oh wow okay quite really recently. recently they were returned right and i get the impression now that the way that archaeology is done is they're trying to be a lot more collaborative and um you know work with the local groups of aboriginal people rather than just kind of yeah we're just taking everything yeah. we'll give it back with yeah. you know so i think that that's the way forward i think that's um really important to do like you wouldn't yeah I, I think I was reading a post and it was like you know what's the line between archaeology and grave robbing and yeah the well. answer is it really depends like 
Yep. You know, there's forensic archaeologists who might work on stuff that's quite, you know, could be your parent or grandparent and, yeah. And then old stuff can be, have a real connection. So it's, it's really, uh, it's an uh, interesting field. It's a question best left for the British Museum, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, too soon. Possibly. Okay. Well, all that talk of Mungo Man and Mungo mm -hmm. Lady leads me to our next story, actually, which is all about our Denisovan cousins and, to a lesser extent, our ancestors. Because this is a species of hominid that split off from our lineage alongside the Neanderthals about 700,000 years ago. Mm. And all we know about them comes from a little finger bone, three teeth, and a sliver of bone, all found in the Denisova cave in Russia's Altai Mountains. But that's all changed now with the discovery of a jawbone found two and a half thousand kilometers away, high on the Tibetan Plateau. So it's possible that the Denisovans, for a people that we've barely any evidence of, they may have been quite widespread throughout Asia. Right, Penny? It's really interesting, yeah, because when I've talked about, we've, we've talked about the Denisovans before, I mean, one of the things that blows me away is how much, you know, how intensely studied these, and it's been said, you know, you can hold the remains in the palm of your hand. Like, that's the evidence we have for this species of human. Um, so, yeah, so this find is actually spectacular. It's actually not a recent find per se. It was actually discovered in the 1980s and donated to um, a museum, I think. But it's only recently been studied. And it's just fascinating what they've found. So, as you said, all the previous remains come from one cave. Um, this one comes in Siberia. This one comes from China in Baishia Cast Cave on the Tibetan Plateau. So, it... Um, is, yeah, like, as you said, really far away from the previous finds. And what is really, really interesting is it's also at a really high altitude. And the environment there is harsh. So 160,000 years ago, it actually would have been an even harsher environment. So it shows that the Denisovans were capable of living in, you know, really extreme conditions what why was it extreme is it just the cold and the altitude the cold and the, and the altitude yeah. Like yeah and which leads to some sort of interesting implications of this find they haven't been able to extract any dna from the bone but they have been able to get some proteins from the teeth and these can be sequenced much like dna i understand that it's not sort of as reliable as dna sequencing the, the, the methods are quite new and so on but if you think about it you know a protein is made from dna so you can it's all linked i'm sure that yeah. these techniques will be refined sure. it's and not 100 so percent, but it's an indication yeah yeah but based on that data it does suggest that this this jaw did belong to a denisovan and that suggests that they were really widespread across um east asia and it also suggests that, or it gives a bit more credence to this idea that um, there could be Denisovan DNA in people, you know, in modern people throughout East Asia and Melanesia, because it's really, it was not, it's not hard to say that when there was, you know, one jawbone in one cave, but it does sort of firm up this evidence. And it's possible that some of the genes or some of the, you know, genetic inheritance that allows people to be living in high altitudes, um, in cold conditions, with low oxygen and so on. These mutations might have come from Denisovans and there could have been interbreeding between them and our ancestors. So ancient Tibetans, you know, picked up this kind of useful trait and have, pa have passed it on. So I mean, I think it's just really, really fascinating because it's just, I love it when we add new, new bits of information to the human story. Like I think we've said before, sometimes it's like, oh, why can't we just have nice things? Why can't we just have this nice, neat theory that just explains everything and it's all very linear and it's all very progressive. 
and it's not like that, and it's fascinating. And terribly, but that would be terribly boring. Exactly. <laughs> boring, wouldn't boring. It? We wouldn't have a podcast then. <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't, would we? <laughs> yeah. but I think it's also it, it's one of those sort of almost an accidental discovery because, as mm. you say, it was found by the monk in 1980 and donated to the Langzhou University. And I, it wasn't until like only a few years ago that they actually were able to test and find out that it was Denisovan. Everyone just thought it was you mm. know, probably a human or some other primate that they had. And it's just been sitting in a university for 30 years. Mm. That's... Mm. And what's fascinating is that actually a project has been started now called Finder and there's all these little unidentifiable slivers of bone which are now going to get tested to sort of see what, who, what they belong to or who they belong mm. to. And some of these could already be Denisovans. We might be able to get, you know, as technology improves, we might be able to get just so much more information about, um, yeah, about that what was happening. Sense. He's yeah, hoping because it's just remarkable that we know quite a bit from s such a small amount of evidence. Yeah. It's just freaky. Well, Lucas, uh, sort of on that note, one of the things I love about covering science is all the accidental discoveries that you find. Those sort of serendipitous moments where something didn't go as planned and before you know it, that mouldy cheese sandwich is saving people from dying of infection through penicillin. So, do you want to tell us about the accidental creation of phosphorine nanoribbons and how they could revolutionise battery technology? Sure, I will. Cool, thank you. Um, uh, it's interesting. That really you... hoping you'd say yes, because if you'd said no, I'd be like in the lurch. A bit lost. Uh, yeah. It was interesting that you you sort of introduced it that way because um, I guess you know me well because this is something that always attracts me to stories is is exactly that when we accidentally find things because for me this is one of the reasons that we we shouldn't focus entirely just on commercialization of scientific research um, and and there are benefits to researching for the sake of research because we just don't know what can spin out of these things uh, in this case I guess we're going we're to wind the clock back slightly, back to 2014, when, when uh, there was a, a particular um, material that was uh, first uh, isolated, which was two-dimensional phosphorine, uh, which is basically sort of like the phosphorus equivalent of graphene. And we've covered graphene a number of times on the podcast, and, and you can find plenty of information about it. Graphene is one of those wonder materials that can, you know, is, is highly conductive and, and it can be applied at, at, at very small scales and really is, is seen as one of the things that could make a, a huge difference in achieving um, true quantum, quantum computing and so forth. Um, this, this new material, though, this uh, phosphorine, um, it, there was a, a group of, of scientists who were trying to create uh, phosphorine sheets. So they were trying to create, you know, sheets of phosphorine. They were kind of trying to come up with a way of, of producing, you know, relatively um, inexpensive way uh, for another purpose. But during their work, they found they accidentally created what they've termed phosphorine nano ribbons. Now, this is very interesting because these these nano ribbons are extremely flat. They're 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 down to one atom high. So this is why a lot of the news coverage has termed them two-dimensional ribbons because, you know, they, they really are, you know, imagine if you just draw a line on a page, you know, the, the height of that biro ink that you've just drawn on the page is significantly higher than these nano ribbons. Um, so, you know, effectively, they they only have length and width. They, they don't have height. Now, in addition to that, they've got other physical attributes, which mean that they can be built up in height beyond that that one atom high, so that they can then have their properties varied. For example, their ability to conduct electricity. So, if, for example, you were trying to limit the flow of electricity, they, that that can be achieved by by changing the the physical dimensions of the of the nano ribbons. If you want them to carry more. You can make them, you know, physically bigger, um, but you can also use them to split these ribbons into multiple pathways, 
which addresses another technological challenge that, that we've had for some time with other materials, which is how to do joins without creating too much resistance because resistance then causes problems in circuitry. For, for one, it often causes heat. So when you're looking at things like nano circuitry, and we're, we're already at the point where we're at nanometer scales for um, you know computer chips and so forth, uh, if you're able to do this with precision, which appears to be the, the outcome of, of this team's research, that they can, with precision, create these nano ribbons uh, of the of the with the physical attributes that they need for the for the application, but also very very cheaply. Um, the process is is quite straightforward, and because of the materials that are used, basically, uh, this might sound a little more complicated than that it is. But but I'm going to read from one of the, the their own synopsis of of their paper. They said the na nano ribbons are formed by mixing black phosphorus with lithium ions dissolved in liquid ammonia at minus 50 degrees Celsius. So fair enough, you can do that in your kitchen. <laughs> Lol. Um, <laughs> that sounds very basic. 20, yeah, yeah uh, very basic. After 24 hours, the ammonia is removed and replaced with an organic solvent, which makes a solution of nano ribbons of mixed sizes. So it's almost like um, reading that, it was a case of, oh, okay, so how, how much precision do they actually have then? Uh, and obviously then it just becomes down to the process. So they, when they were trying to make these sheets, Apparently, they then basically found, we, well, we've made ribbons. <laughs> we asked for sheets, we got mm -hmm. ribbons. And then they found just how specific and well-defined these things were. And they're very, very uniform. So when you end up with a, a ribbon of a particular thickness and length, um, it's, it's the same height, the entire length of that ribbon. And that, of course, is one of the challenges. But the really, really cool thing is just how cheap it is to make them. And the fact that using phosphorine, is uh, is based on phosphorus. It's much much cheaper and more accessible and more abundant than lithium. So lithium ions are one of the the key um, materials right now. Oh, sorry, not lithium ions. Lithium is one of the key materials for us right now because it's it's uh, it's very essential to our rechargeable battery technologies. All of your phones, um, electric cars. Um, the the Tesla batteries and 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 similar that are charged by solar uh, arrays and so forth. These are predominantly using lithium cells. Now the problem with lithium, or one of the problems with lithium, is that it's it's not particularly abundant. Um, so as a result, there's uh, some. I was just learning last week. I was doing some financial uh, stuff, um, and there was a. Um, a comment made about uh, an organisation, CSL, one of the big, you know, big companies that are that are heavily investing, I think, in in lithium mining again right at the moment because they're betting on, you know, the the up upswell of of demand on lithium. Yeah. Now, lithium is not good for the environment. It's not it's not good to work with. It's actually quite dangerous, and it does leave us with a a waste problem. Um, by contrast, the um, the phosphorus doesn't give us that that problem at all um, and it's a lot more um, uh, abundant so it it's it's looks like it could be a triple whammy of giving us a material that has attributes physically that are that are better than anything else for these applications it's also more abundant and this team has shown that it can be made quite cheaply so if you're ticking the boxes, you know, in terms of technologies, often you'll you'll read stories or you'll hear stories about, hey, some new thing is found, and they think within five years, so it's five, years, <laughs> within five years, this will be uh, this will be changing the landscape in blah blah blah. Um, in this case, this is a major hurdle that's been that's been um, stepped across, or several major hurdles. So put put it into perspective. If you if you are using these um, in batteries, we could we could be looking because of their physical attributes of charging the batteries up to a thousand times faster than we currently can. So your mobile phone battery, which if you're lucky with some of the really cool technology, quick charge and stuff like that, you can, some people can charge their mobile phones up to almost full capacity within about half an hour. You could be talking just a few minutes, you know, tops. Um, it also means that they may have even greater they they the the authors suggest up to fifty percent greater capacity in, in in terms of how much charge they can hold, and this is down to the material. 
So that's huge. Battery technology is one of the massive problems we have right now that's holding us back in 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 much greater strides when it comes to um, uh, uh, reusable energy. Um, so. So you know we can we can collect the energy, but we have to store the energy so that we can use it in other periods when you know whatever our, our natural source is, whether it's sunlight or wind or waves or whatever, is not available. So we need to be able to store it. So so this is a big deal. Um, they also talk about how the, these nano ribbons could be used um, to harvest heat for energy from, for example, clothing. So these nano ribbons are very very robust. They, they maintain their thickness, they maintain the configuration, but they're able to bend and twist, which means they could be built into fabrics. So they suggested, for example, they might they might able, uh, might able to use them and, and take advantage of their thermoelectric properties so that they could put them into clothing, which could then uh, harvest heat uh, from the body. And then, for example, they might function as like a heart and blood sugar level monitors which are powered by body heat. So rather than you know having to wear sensors for those things, you just put on the T-shirt that has them built in, um, which yeah. never requires batteries or any of that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's, again, to me, I, th I think it's, it's quite clear uh, we are going to see the application of this. Um, it, it won't be one of those things that's interesting and if only we could find a way to do it cheaply. Um, and the applications are probably far and wide, much wider than the authors have have, have um, uh, come up with so speculated. far. Speculated. That was the word. I was going to say stipulated, but yeah, <laughs> speculated is the word I was looking for. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, we'll probably see them in, in electronics. We'll probably see them in, in computing because, you know, the, remember the Moore's Law, The every two years yeah. the uh, computing power is meant to double? Well, that's that's looking like for the first time since Moore – you know, uh, put this out there, that's looking like actually starting to slow down because we're being held up by by materials right now. Material science is holding us up from from that continuing to, to double every two years. So this sort of thing can be a game changer in that respect. So I think we'll see more about this. It'll be very, very interesting mm, to uh, see up. where it goes. Um, since 2014, when when the material was first discovered, not the not the nano ribbons, but but the the graphene uh, micro graphene itself or nano graphene, they um, uh, there were over a hundred papers very very quickly talking about the potential ramifications of this material. So you know, it's, the the community is very interested in it, the scientific community. Yeah, as you say, the renewables thing is. It, it's a shows that we need it because that's one avenue that's going to be very important but also that could spearhead that research and development where you're going to have a lot of money being put into battery technology in the coming years so hopefully we'll get a lot more research into this sort of thing and it's an exciting time okay joe let's talk about an impending crisis in medicine now and it's the rise of the superbug and as more and more bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics Researchers are having to look elsewhere for treatments. And a British teenager, Isabel Holdaway, owes her life to an old treatment that's had a modern reboot. This is the first genetically modified bacteriophage that's been used to successfully treat an illness, isn't it? That's right. Uh, so bacteriophages are fascinating, especially given the fact that, as you say, it's a, it's an old treatment that's uh, that's been given a a bit of a refresh. Uh, so bacteriophages are viruses that um, that infect and uh, and replicate bacteria. Uh, sorry, replicate with bacteria. But um, but the difference is that they're not harmful to humans. They're only harmful to bacteria. So you know the the idea here is that by identifying uh, bact particular bacteriophages that um, are effective on certain bacteria that harm humans, that those bacteriophages can be administered as, a, uh, as an alternative form of antibiotic in order to treat difficult uh, infections. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we look at the young girl that you mentioned, uh, Isabel Holdaway is a 17-year-old who has cystic fibrosis 
Now, cystic fibrosis is a genetic uh, uh, illness that uh, is incredibly – well, there, there is no cure for cystic fibrosis. It's a lifelong illness, and sufferers, uh, certainly within uh, developed countries, have a life expectancy of between 45 to 50 years. Uh, you know, they, they suffer a great deal from uh, lung infections. One of the things that happens in cystic fibrosis is that uh, mucus in the lungs, which is normally thin, becomes very, very thick, and, it, and it's very difficult for them to breathe. Now, uh, often what happens uh, in these individuals is that uh, over time they lose uh, lung function to the point where the only way they can uh, they can be managed is through a lung transplant. And this is what happened to Isabel Holdaway. The problem with uh, with with lung transplants or organ transplants in people with cystic fibrosis is that they are incredibly susceptible to infection. And uh, and after she had her lung transplant, uh, Isabel, in fact, developed uh, an infection that could not be uh, treated with antibiotics. It was what's called a mycobacterium. Uh, and, and the type of uh, infections we normally see with mycobacterium are uh, tuberculosis and leprosy and so on. And it, it, it's something about the structure of the cell wall in these mycobacterium that make them extremely difficult to treat with conventional antibiotics. So uh, for Isabel, uh, you know, she'd had this lung transplant and these inf this infection that had taken hold of her body was, was not uh, able to be treated and, and she was essentially moved to palliative care. And her mum, uh, in desperation, started uh, doing, you know, something we normally discourage people from doing, but I think that in this case it's <laughs> born fruit, uh, she did a bit of Dr. Googling and uh, she came across um, – uh, discussions around uh, this phage treatment or bacteriophage treatment. And she went to uh, her daughter's doctors at the Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, which is one of, you know, one of the, the great hospitals in the world. And, and she approached them uh, with this idea of this phage therapy and, and asked them what they thought about this. And, um, in, you know, I think quite fortunately, uh, some of the people involved were actually aware of this and, and, uh, and were, you know, open to the possibility. And uh, they started investigating, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what options were available to, to use this phage therapy. Um, now, how, how they actually went about doing this is really interesting because um, it turns out that there's there's a project that's um, being conducted, uh, and and it's a it's a, it's a it's a research course for first year undergraduate students, uh, and, and and it's a way to uh, really sort of encourage undergraduate students to be able to participate in scientific discovery um, through researching phages because phages are extremely uh, prevalent in the environment, very easy to find, and and what they've done is in a number of institutions worldwide they've engaged these undergraduate students in these programs to uh, to find these phages in the environment. They can then name their phage, and then they actually can um, conduct uh, uh, sequencing and so on to understand, uh, you know, what, what these particular phages can do and how they're, you know, how they're made up. So, uh, before you go on, yes, I think you mentioned that they get to name the phages. Yes, I think we yes, need to touch on that. Oh, the names are wonderful. There's Mario Kart. There's Leafy, Lixi, Muddy, Chicken Nugget, Chupacabra. <laughs> TGI Friday and I am Groot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So uh, clearly, some imaginative uh, STEM students out there doing work on these on these uh, bacteriophages. See, why so, is that on the advertising, the recruitment drive? Get people into STEM. I know, you get to absolutely. name things. I am Groot. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So samples of um, of some of these uh, bacteriophages were sent to a phage expert at the, at the University of Pittsburgh, and um, uh, in, in about 2017, the uh, the researcher who who is this phage expert, a man by the name of Graham Hatful, uh, got a call from the doctors of Great Ormond Street in London, um, and they essentially looked at how they could potentially you know use the bacteriophages to treat her her infection. They they managed to find – now, this is where it, it becomes quite interesting and, and it's also related a little bit to the issue of um, antibiotic resistance. It, you, 
it's unwise to attempt to treat a bacterial infection, as, as I understand it, with a single type of phage because bacteria can develop resistance to a phage in the same way as they can develop resistance to an antibiotic. But by using multiple types of phages, um, it is less likely that the bacteria would be able to develop this resistance, uh, certainly develop it as quickly. The problem was, though, that two of the bacteriophages that they were wanting to use were not uh, were not powerful enough uh, to do what they were wanting it to do. So they actually genetically modified them, and they then unleashed these three bacteriophages: muddy, lixy, and leafy. And uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> it's quite adorable. <laughs> it's, it's like some kids' show. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> I think you could do some really wonderful, um, uh, what do you call it, animations with little mm. pages with their weird alien bodies. <laughs> the adventures of Muddy, Leafy and Lixie. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, so uh, so they started injecting the three phages, one, one um, uh, naturally occurring and the other two genetically modified into uh, the patient. And uh, after, uh, I think, about a month, the infection in her chest began to disappear. Uh, not long after that, her liver cleared up. And after about six months, all of the other infectious lesions had uh, had disappeared, um, which was quite remarkable. But what was also particularly interesting about this is uh, that she, according to the reports, she didn't experience any major side effects from the treatment. Uh, now, you know, I think there are a number of things that we need to kind of think about here, which is, first of all, uh, in terms of the possibilities for dealing with the really frightening risks of uh, of the, the growing antimicrobial resistance and the fact that we may soon lose the use of antibiotics that have, you know, saved millions of lives and no longer can, may no longer be able to be used is we now have a potential alternative. The problem here is, of course, we're humans and we've handled antibiotics up appallingly and continue to do so, even though we now do have uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs to ensure that we use them uh, more sensibly. So my, my one worry would be if these are proven to be useful, uh, you know, uh, more, more uh, universally, are we going to do with bacteriophages what we've done with antibiotics, which is essentially to promote further uh, bacterial resistance and so on. So with any new treatment, I think, you know, we, we need to take a long, hard look at ourselves and, and look at how we actually utilise these treatments. Uh, so that, that's the one aspect that, that I find interesting uh, uh, and concerning. But nonetheless, also terribly exciting that, you know, this might prove to be a useful treatment. Well, just on that, Joe, the other... the, sorry if I may mm. interrupt for a second. They... Uh, uh, and I'm not sure whether you mentioned it there. Uh, you may have, but the fact that they once they identified the, the, a phage that was quite effective at at uh, mm. at infecting this, they they modified it. They genetically modified. It. They removed a gene, which made that's it right more that's effective. Right. So that to me, it kind of it, it greatly broadens the the application here because if we're if we've got We've only got a certain number of phages that we know about in terms of that they've been catalogued and we, we can see what effect they have on things. And and um, Hatful and, and his team had been apparently cataloging and testing these things for, for about a decade and, and, mm -hmm. and starting to build up a, a sort of a, a knowledge a knowledge library of, of what uh, which phases were a uh, fa here we go again which <laughs> phages were, were effective against different types of bugs um, but if if GMs added to the mix um, this is this is something that we, you know we've not really been able to apply all that much to antibiotics is, is, in my understanding so and and of course we've got the the other problem that that drug companies are not, uh, putting that there's very little research being still going into uh, antibiotics at this point in time, just because of the the whole, you know, much greater problem with the with the pharmaceutical industry and the tiny margins and and issues with with how much they they get their return on investment back. So uh, it sounds I incredibly exciting, but also the the GM element I think is is really interesting. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I, I think it'd be interesting to see how this plays out because, of course, when uh, when antibiotics were first discovered, 
Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how how things work then in terms of the companies that produce them and, um, you know, what it was like then in terms of, you know, returns on investments and so on. But certainly what what drove the, the production of antibiotics then, aside from potentially being able to profit from them, is that the deaths from bacterial infections then would have been so much greater. There would have been a real societal uh, demand that would have driven it in the same way that, you know, the demand for, vac- for vaccines at the time. Um, so I, I just think, sort of from a from a societal perspective, it's kind of interesting to see what the the push and pull factors are in, in how an industry kind of deals with the need for a technology, um, whether or not they're willing to invest in it because there may not be sort of any great return for them. Mm. Um, so so yeah, so look that 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 that's the one element. The other thing that is important to remember in this case is that this wasn't conduct. This was not done as part of a clinical trial. Um, this this was experimental medicine, but not a clinical trial. So it it, it was an uncontrolled experiment. Um, and w- what now would need to happen is that there would need to be you know true you know phase one, two, and three mm-hmm. trials to to sort of really see um, what was at play here. What were the factors? that resulted in this extremely positive response to this treatment. I mean, one would think that it's highly unlikely that something other than the um, the, the, the bacteriophage therapy was responsible for this, given that nothing else had helped until this point. Um, and that's why we do research. That's why we do clinical trials in order to be able to sort of really work this out. You know, and they say that the side effects that she experienced, there were no major side effects. Sure, that's one patient. We need to actually see in a controlled manner. We need to be able to catalogue and and really sort of work out what are the risks to patients uh, from different types of bacteriophages and and so on. Um, so th- those are still unanswered questions, which are are really important if we're going to move forward with this. Yeah, I, I and it's funny that you alluded to the or you mentioned Dr. Google specifically before because that was the first thing that I kind of thought when mm. I. When I was reading through this story, it's a case of uh, then her mum, who's incidentally was was named Joe, or is named Joe. Uh, so <laughs> when I was reading through the story, whilst you were talking, it kept saying Joe said, Joe said. <laughs> um, but she's uh, everywhere. She's everywhere. <laughs> but um, but yeah, they you know in in scientific scepticism in in those circles, we you know we we we've often talk about. Um, the the non you know the the, the off mainstream um, uh, medicine uh, research and so forth and experimental stuff that's that's conducted by people like Stanislaw Bazinski where you know this is something that we're very critical about because they don't come they they never seem to publish anything they never actually no. come out with oh well this is what the this is what the actual mechanism is and this is what we're doing about it so there's people who are you know raising money from their families and communities to go and have these treatments overseas mm. um and and they and nev- nothing ever seems to progress whereas at least in this case you know, it's a case of, all right, here's the science, here's what we know, we think we can try this, and here's all our results at the end of it. You know, you, mm, <laughs> at least, mm. you know what I mean? At, at least it doesn't stink of that, mm. that, you know. What's very interesting, though, and there, there's a, an important and, and interesting ethical debate um, around this, is that we have a whole infrastructure, a massive regulatory in, uh, environment around the conduct of clinical trials. Uh, you know, anyone who wants to... Con- to uh, conduct a clinical trial needs to jump through massive regulatory hoops uh, with the FDA or the TGA and and so on um, through the institutions that they conduct that uh, those clinical trials in in order to ensure that proper um, uh, practices are adhered to and so on. But when when you're conducting experimental medicine, as is the case here, those rules don't apply. Um, and and so sort of what what's required in order to be able to um, conduct these kinds of uh, experiments uh, is quite different. So broadly speaking, um, you know, it, it, it's an important ethical question around the demands we place on doctors and scientists uh, when offering or well, the demands we place on doctors, I should say, when offering uh, experimental treatments to patients, because ultimately. Any medical treatment is an experiment 
because for any treatment, we don't know how an individual patient is going to respond to that treatment. But when giving a person or offering a person a treatment, what ethically justifies that in terms of uh, the the treatments that have been um, considered to be so-called standard of care is that there's a body of research that has demonstrated plausibility, that there's a likelihood of effectiveness and so on. Um, You know, in a case like this where, you know, there is no uh, body of evidence to support the treatment, it is is an entirely experimental treatment, uh, you know, with no knowledge of the potential risks and benefits. Um, so, you know, where, where my big interest is from an ethical perspective is in, the, is in the area of informed consent, is that any patient being offered a treatment like this is fully aware of the risks and is able to make a decision that, uh, you know, is in line with with they value and what they want for their life and that's going to really vary from person to person in terms of you know some people will literally want to do everything in Mm. order to uh, uh, maintain a length of life and other people are much more concerned about the quality of the time that they have left and so on Um, so you know when you look at what happened with this girl obviously uh, you know it sounds like this was a family who really kind of had done a lot of research on what their options were. You know, she was in palliative care, so they knew that there were, you know, that there were no options. Mm. And often these types of experimental treatments, you know, if they offer a glimmer of hope, people are willing to try them. But had had there been the risk of serious, serious, you know, horrible side effects from this treatment, you know, what then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that is actually one of the things that I really like about phage therapy is that it is so targeted uh, because yeah. these phages usually will only infect one particular strain of bacteria. So you can mm. be fairly certain you're not going to accidentally knock anything else out by mistake. Mm. Mm. As fairly certain as we can be at this very early stage in the uh, yes. research. What, what, so. what's, been holding, yes. what's been holding the use of phages back? Because I know they've they've shown they've certainly, you know, they've been around for a while. Like well, obviously they've been around for a while, but our knowledge of them been, has been around <laughs> for a while. We we we've known for a long time that they that they've got a great deal of promise, but what's holding them back? I think when you have something that is so individual and specific like phages, it's so much easier to use the blunt force of an antibiotic, which will kill out most of the ones that are rather than finding out the individual specific phage that will work for your particular uh, ailment Mm. Uh, so once penicillin and other antibiotics came along phage therapy just dropped off uh, the Mm. radar a a fair bit i think it it kept on going in russia and some of that eastern bloc uh, region where they didn't have the same resources that in the west we had for making antibiotics so there are still some. Looks as if, it certainly looks as if there are areas. Uh, Joe, stop. Uh, I'm going to get you to unplug your microphone and plug it back in again because it's doing the interference. It actually does look like there are a number of areas where uh, there has been more research into phage. Um, so, for example, in the food industry, um, the FDA have approved a number of different products um, such as a product for treating ready to what they've described as ready to eat poultry and meat products. Um, right. and they've also used it. They've used it on cheese to kill listeria uh, and so on. Now, what, what I what I find interesting, of course, is um, you know uh, at what at what point uh, will there will there be some demand that these be labelled as you know as having uh. been in contact with genetically modified organisms? Of course, of course. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if at some point someone decides to protest and object. Frankenfoods. <laughs> Yep. Oh. Yeah. Frank and Mets. Uh, Frank and Mets. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's a very exciting therapy. So we'll see where it goes, uh, especially now that we're genetically modifying it. I think that's going to be a big, big boon. Yeah, definitely. And how quickly they were able to do it too. That was, that was really what surprised me. Yeah. Um, so they, they seem to be, you know, when, when when you look at kind of what they described about how easy it is for, for students to be able to work with them and, and identify them, and I suppose the technology uh, has advanced hugely, uh, you know, a, a, as well, but it does seem like they're relatively easy to work with. Mm. 
Yeah, it sounds easy. I would probably struggle, but they seem to know what they're doing. So, yeah. well, certainly, I know we've done stories where um, uh, we've been surprised at how incredibly easy easy it is for students to, you know, start modifying genes with CRISPR and stuff. I mean that, and and mm-hmm. there's been scientists that have talked about. Well, it's so easy that it's going to happen. We're going to, and we've seen it, you know, in in I think China already, where, you know, with the modifications for those babies to make them less susceptible to whatever it was uh, hiv um that was it yeah and and there's also um we've we've mainly been talking about crispr cas9 there's now a crispr cas3 which is even more um precise and i think it's better able at editing long chains of genes uh, and you can so pick it up at like the 7-eleven now i think <laughs> it's getting that, that no common. no that's that's fake news fake. <laughs> <laughs> But um, no, so yeah, it's further technologies that are developing that'll make this sort of thing so much more ubiquitous and powerful. So it will be interesting to see what happens. But let's move on. And Penny, we're frequently talking about how trees and plants, despite our view of them, I guess, as being simple life forms, but they're always listening and communicating with each other. And they're far more complicated than we tend to give them credit. Uh, Do you want to tell us all about the wood wide web? Yeah, and I have to confess the reason I was drawn to this was because of that catchy headline. (laughs) I'm not going to say clickbait. Um, It's clickbait. Because it's not a true clickbait. It's not true. It's not this one weird fact that trees will keep you reading. But um, the wood wide web did did get me reading. Um, I've come across this idea before and it was something I kind of went, that's cool and then moved on with my life. So it's quite interesting to read about it. And the idea is that we always, like, you know, we love to break things down and analyse them and we study trees as if they are organisms in isolation, just like we like to think that humans are organisms in isolation when really we're living in relationships with all sorts of bacteria and this and that, you know, on our skin and in our guts. Same with trees. There's every forest and, you know, you can kind of think of as not being an organism, but certainly being a bit more, there's this closer relationships than your traditional kind of food web would lead you to believe, you know, oh, something eats a tree and then you have all your different kind of animals eating it. And then mm-hmm. finally bacteria and fungi break it down and it's a great circle of life. Yep. It does seem that trees, I'm hesitant to say communicate with each other are connected to each other there's this really complicated underground web of roots and fungi and bacteria and tree roots are often surrounded by these sort of symbiotic organisms like fungi which can be essential for the tree to grow so the tree might not be able to grow without them and when we look at forests we're looking not at trees in isolation but you know, they need the right soil, the right bacteria in the soil mm. and the right, you know, environment for these um, fungi and so on to exist. And the connections, I don't think we're really understanding yet what these connections mean. This sort of network is 500 million years old because that's how long plants have been growing on the Earth's surface. Now, what's happened Now, the reason that this has come up in the news is because using machine learning, this sort of subterranean, I'll say network, has been mapped. Um, So they've looked at 1.2 million forest tree plots, 28,000 species, and more than 70 countries. Now, I think this is one of those things that are so complex. You could dig into it in so many different ways. So I'm just going to go with the, um, the take that, Uh, that the BBC did, which is looking at the way that um, the information that this can give us in terms of understanding climate change. There's different kinds of um, mycorrhizal fungi or fungi that live in tree roots, a buscular fungi and ectomycorrhizal fungi. So the first kind, a buscular fungi, penetrate the roots of the host trees. The ectomycorrhizal fungi surround the tree's roots without penetrating them. And they both work differently in terms of carbon. The ectomycorrhizal fungi are ones that tend to lock up carbon from the atmosphere. They're really vulnerable to climate change. 
the Arbuscular fungi, um, which are more dominant in the tropics. So sort of South America, you know, sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia and so on, um, uh, promote fast carbon cycling. So the other kind, the ones that are good at locking up carbon but are vulnerable to climate change are the ones that are found in the forests more of the northern hemisphere. In fact, it's, it's having a look at the heat maps, it's almost a, not complete, but definite, there's definite trends there. In yeah, terms it's northern of Europe and many. North America. Yeah. yeah, yeah, northern Europe and North America mainly. Um, poor old Australia, we're all desert, <laughs> we're very black on that map in terms of like not much going on. But that's just, right. just lack of research or lack of fungi? Just lack of trees. <laughs> it's called the Nullarbor for a reason, I think. Um, you know? So. Yep. It could be lack of research, but I'm just get, looking at the other places that are blanked out. I'm going to guess it's lack of trees, like Greenland and the Sahara. So, yeah. Yeah. No, black is no trees. Yep. Yeah. So... What's interesting, though, is that those kinds of fungi, the one, the EM fungi, the ectomycorrhizal ones, as temperatures rise, these fungi, their tree species, are going to be declined and be re replaced by that more tropical kind of fungi, which has um, implications for climate change. It means that the ones that support carbon stores in the soil are being lost they're being replaced by the kinds of fungi that are like, yep, here's some more carbon for the atmosphere, which affects our climate change modelling. It affects maybe where we should be putting our efforts in terms of looking after trees and forests. Uh, and it's also just a really fascinating data set. So that, when this fungi yeah. dies, it releases that carbon that it's trapped, does it? I don't know if it's when it dies or what part of its life cycle it is, but the uh -huh. I'm going to call them the tropical kind. Do just they're not so great at you know sinking carbon into the soil. I guess it does release it back into the uh, atmosphere. Okay. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Mm. So more depressing. <laughs> well, not depressing. I mean, in a way, it's great. Like now we know this is exactly. not going to take anyone by surprise unless they purposely choose to have yeah. it as a surprise but yeah. it's it's as you say the more we know the better we're able to divert resources and to target specific uh methods of yeah. climate change harm reduction which is what we desperately desperately need mm. um also i like that part of this what, what he's done is that they've mapped a lot of this network across the globe and that was based on looking at uh, previous research which was taking information from various government bodies around the world mm. which had already mapped out the trees that were there and calculated and that's how they estimated that there were three trillion trees on the planet and from that they were then able to look at how the trees interact with other you know with the fungi and with other trees and things and develop the network from that which is it's really pretty cool, cool. yeah and i think that's a pretty nice note to end the show on as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 332. And don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate to chip in and help us make the show. Thank you, Penny, Lucas, and Joe. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Thanks Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. New Jersey now has an official state microbe. Governor Murphy making it official today. It is called Streptomyces griseus. It was discovered on New Jersey soil in 1916. In 1943, researchers at Rutgers used the microbe to create an antibiotic used to kill tuberculosis. In 1952, lead researcher Selman Waksman was awarded the Nobel Prize for the Nobel Prize for medicine because of the discovery.